about 20 different ways how to start the message this morning, and I, you know, I thought about talking about when Pastor Hall called me, and you know how, of course, when he said, "Hey, brother, do you, would you preach Sunday morning and you know be spiritual and say, of course not? What are you thinking? It's got to be somebody else's job, not me." <laughs> but you know, really, I think what really won out in my thought this morning is um, if you would have told me back in uh, 1987 when I first joined the Air Force that I'd end up in Utah. Um, yeah. Having an opportunity being here now almost 17 years and, and just all the things that's happened, um, I am blessed to have such great friends and have such a great church as Faith Baptist Church has been to my family. Um, it's, it's just incredible. I'm old enough now that I can make these kind of statements that, you know, that old people make. It's like, I can't believe how fast the time has gone, you know, things like that. Um, but it, it's just amazing. I, I appreciate the things that Colton said, but uh, I'll tell you this morning, I'm not qualified to be up here. There's a lot of men I look to in this church that I think are far greater uh, uh, monuments to what God's doing in people's life than, than my life by far. And I praise God for those testimonies, and I praise God for our pastor and, and Pastor Hall and, and everybody that's on the staff and, and the, uh, just all the things that go on here week after week. It's easy to have a high Sunday, you know, everything be exciting. It's a lot harder just to be consistent and be honest and, and uh, faithful to God when you're just going through the trenches. And I think that's what uh, our pastoral staff here does week after week, and they're such a blessing. Let's go to uh, uh, Psalms chapter 4 and verse 5. Psalms chapter 4 and verse 5. That's where we'll start this morning. And this morning, the, what the Lord laid on my heart to do was just to basically talk about Two words that are pivotal in the Christian faith but, and are easily interchanged but are so necessary in our society, so necessary in a Christian walk, and that, that is this, belief and faith. And the definition of belief is this, to stand firm, to trust, to be certain. Going over to a Psalms chapter 4 and verse 5, it says, Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Let's pop over to Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. Proverbs 3, verse 5. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And who, class? The Lord shall direct your paths. So what I thought we'd do is look at a group of people in two different circumstances. The first circumstance where we can see where faith and belief was just executed. It was, it was exactly what God had in mind. And then another example, that didn't go so well. So let's go back to Joshua chapter 6 and verse 1. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 1 is where we're, we'll spend some time this morning. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because the children of Israel, none went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thy hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And he shall compass the city, and all ye men of war, and go around about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And, the, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seven days shall, excuse me, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that they make a... That Excuse me, that when they make a long blast with the ram's horns and, with, and when you hear the sound of the trumpets, all the people shall shout with a great shout and the walls of the city shall fall down flat and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Now, uh, Brother Russ did a great uh, job last week setting up the, the deal here. So remember, the children of Israel have wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. God's finally, the generations passed away that was God's plan, God's design because of the choices they made. They were going into the promised land as God had promised. And as they came into the promised land, there was a river that was stood up on a heap. Remember Jericho? And the waters were stopped. And Israel's walked through on dry land. And that's where we pick up the story right here. So the first battle that God's going to have them do is at the city of Jericho. Now, Jericho is a very interesting place as far as its fortifications. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about it. But historically, it talks about where the walls were somewhere between 12 and 17 feet tall and at least 6 feet deep. So this was a pretty serious deal. And Israel hadn't had a whole lot of opportunity to figure out warfare at this point in time. They've pretty much wandered in the wilderness, and here they are, and this is their first real battle. So going back up to verse 2, 
And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given unto thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. When it comes to believing, it's not blind faith. It's not blind believing. God has said things in his word that he meant. God never put anything in his word that he didn't mean. So when these men are about to take the city, when the nation of Israel is about to take the city, it's a big deal because God said, it's what you're going to do. It's your opportunity. This is this land I promised you. This is what I want to give you. And it wasn't like Israel just came up with this bright idea. You know what? I think what we'll do today is we'll just get up and we'll take the city of Jericho. Uh, sorry, take the city of Jericho. No, God had told him in verse 2, And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given, thy, thy, given thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty man of valor. Let's go over to Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 1. Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. So again, this isn't just blind belief. And God doesn't set us up that way where all of a sudden out of the blue, hey, you're just going to go do this thing. God in his word has set up things. So let's see here for this, this particular case that Israel is going to have this battle. Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 1. And when thou goest out to battle against thine enemy, seest, and seest the horses and the chariots of uh, people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and it shall be when ye come, and when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye, ye approach this day unto the battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified against them. And for the Lord your God is, is he that goeth with you to fight your Fight for you against the enemies to save you. So here's Israel. They're getting ready to fight this battle. God had made him a promise back in Deuteronomy that when you go to fight, there's a certain way to do it. Have the priest talk to the people and know that I'm going to fight the battle for you. If we go back to Joshua chapter 6, that's exactly what God said. Who's going to go before him? They're going to be the priests. They're going to be the Ark of the Covenant, the priests, and the, and the, and the people are set up in a very specific order. Now, I spent 20 years in the Air Force. I saw some tactics and stuff, and I have never seen any battle tactic where it says, hey, get up, go around a city, and then go back, go back to camp, wait for the next day, and then do that on the next day, and the next day. So what's God doing here? He's proving them a little bit. Could you imagine the children of Israel? We, the Bible doesn't record it, but I bet you what happened is, as they went around the city, the people inside were scared, weren't they? The noise had already been broadcasted. Here comes Israel. And there's been some things that happened on the other side of Jordan. And here they're coming into this place. And they're, they're approaching the city. And God is with them. Some things have happened that make us very nervous. So they were scared, but they knew they still had the, the people of Jericho still had to fight. So here they are going around. So what usually happens in battle? Somebody's usually provoking somebody. Somebody's usually teasing somebody. So you can imagine the men of, of valor standing on the top of the wall, probably yelling at the children of Israel, maybe even throwing rocks at them, and provoking and trying to get something to happen, trying to get Israel maybe to break ranks and to take the city. Because what happens if you divide an army? It's a whole lot easier to conquer, is it not? But the Bible records that Israel didn't do that. They walked around the first day. They walked around the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth, and the sixth. Now, on the seventh day, what were they supposed to do? Go around seven times. Could you imagine walking around the city seven times? Now, don't you think after maybe day three or day four, you're kind of starting to wonder a little bit, is God really going to do something here? We've never seen God do something like this, where these mighty walls that we're looking at are going to be flattened. We've seen God do some amazing things, but we've never seen God do this. Is he really going to do this? Is this really worth my time in walking around the city? Is this really what God wants us to do, or is this just some crazy thing that Joshua came up with? What's really going to happen? Some wonderment? Some kind of concern? Maybe Satan, who's usually what in there to confuse, destroy? He's probably getting in their heads a little bit and going, hey, this is dumb. Don't you feel a little stupid walking around the city? But yet they did it, and they followed God's plan and God's purpose. And as they did it, they went to the seventh. They went to the seventh day, and what happened on the seventh day? After they went around seven times, they blew the trumpet. They blew the trumpet. The people shouted out, and the wall stayed up. They what? You're going to have to interact. I'm sorry. I'm not a one-way teacher. I know. The walls came down, right? And Israel went in, and a massive victory took place. But there was a warning. Go down to in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 18. Joshua 6, verse 18. Helps if I'm at the right chapter. <laughs> Joshua chapter 6, verse 18. And ye in, in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed 
when you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and, and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So Israel only had to do a couple things, right? They had to walk around the city. Now, was Israel capable of doing that? Yep, they were healthy enough. They were able to go around the city. Was Israel able to have the ram's horns and the Ark of the Covenant? Yes, God provided all those things that they needed there. All they had to do what? Was believe God, right? That's all they had to do. But once the walls came down, God said something very specific. Don't take any spoils of this city. It's a first fruit city. And the first fruits belong to who, class? Belong to the Lord. That's why. God was going to take care of Israel in other battles. They get the spoil. But on this first city, it was for, for the Lord, not to touch anything else. So the walls come down. Everything's good to go. And then go, down to, go over to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 30. So the children of Israel had simple directions. They followed those directions. And they did everything that God had called them to do. And who, who would fight the battle for them? Would it be the people or God? It would be God, right? So we get back here to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 30. And it says here, by what class? Faith. The walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Why did God do it this way? To show himself strong. Could you imagine, and the Bible does record this, and all the other cities around, when they heard what happened to Jericho, 12 to 17 foot walls, 6 foot deep, and they fell down, and Israel just took them like it was nothing. And Israel didn't have to do anything but walk around the city for a week, and this whole, this massive fortification was destroyed like that. Now, you get, now you're a small city in another part of, of, the, of the promised land. What are you thinking? Man, God is, God is something more than we can handle. And the Bible talks about later on the kings getting together and trying to fight against Israel because they knew they were outnumbered. They knew things were beyond their ability to control. But who get all the glory for this? It wasn't the Israelites. It was God. Because God did everything. What did Israel have to do? Just simply believe. Now, in this battle that's recorded here, how many people died? Zero. Nobody died. Everything was executed perfectly. Everything worked out great. But let's go over to Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. Joshua 7, verse 1. So here's been a great example of just believing God, taking me at face value, using what God has given you, and to, take the, and to uh, just do and believe what God has for you to do. And Joshua 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass and the cursed thing. For Achan, the son of Car uh, Carmi, the son of uh, Zabadee, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took the accursed thing, and, anger, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And they took and they make, excuse me, and make not all the people of, to labor thither, for they are but a few. So first part of this, somebody did something wrong, right? God had very simple directions. Don't take a spoil of the land. Don't do this. Just leave it be. Put it in the treasury. Everything will be great. That's what God's plan and purpose was. But somebody didn't follow God's directions. And now there's something that's about to take place that, that's a mess. But there's another thing we want to see here in this passage of Scripture. Go back to uh, verse 3. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai, and, take, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. Do you see any part here where the children of Israel are consulting God? Who won the first battle for him? It was the Lord, right? But now all of a sudden we're getting this concept and Israel struggles with this time and time again as they get into the promised land with the battles, which is this. Sticking with God's plan and not coming up with something better themselves. Go over to Judges chapter, in Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. Judges 21, 25. Judges 21 and verse 25. And in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in their own eyes. We all have the same propensity. We all have the same desire. Hey, you know what? God did some things in my life. and He's brought me through some things. I've gone through some trials. And things have gone really well. But now I'm facing this thing. And I have this idea of what I should do to get through this thing. And we start this concept of doing that which is right in our own eyes. And that's what the children of Israel are doing here. Hey, you know what? Let's not make everybody go out and fight the battle. 
We don't need to do that. We just took out Jericho. Who took out Jericho? It was God. It wasn't, it wasn't children of Israel. It was God. But now they're thinking, you know what? We're getting pretty good here. We can Man, we just took out. AI is a small town. Not a big deal. Let's just do this. Not, no, no problem. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 7. The Jericho. Not a one. Faith and belief in God. God wants us to do this. God wants us to do it this way. God wants us to use these tools and do it at this time. And everything's going to work out great if we'll just follow God. AI, you know, we got a better plan. We're going to do that which is right in our own eyes. And we're going to do it this way. We're going to only take a small group of people. We're going to fight this battle. It was all said and done. Israel's running. And 36 people are lost. All because of what? Was the lack of God's desire to do anything? No. It wasn't a lack of that. It was simply this. People had given up on their faith. They, free, they left their belief. Go over to um, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. Hebrews 3 and verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. There is something more disastrous than anything politically that's going on in the United States. There is something more disastrous than anything can happen basically in any, any war that we fight, fought. And that's the church of God developing a heart of unbelief, as it talks about in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. And that's what happened to the children of Israel at Ai. You know, we don't need God. We can do things our way, and we can do it. Everything will work out just great. If we'll just, just do things our way, we don't need God. Like, Brother Ed, I would never do that. I would never think that way. That's not, but think of it this way. What do our actions show of us? What happens here in verse 6. On his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening time, and he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust upon their heads. What take pla what's taking place here? A realization like of this: something has gone terribly wrong, and it's me. What's going on in the nation? AI. Eventually it's destroyed and Israel takes AI and they take the rest of the promised land. How did that all happen? By believing what God had told them to do. So Brother Ed, what does that mean to me? Go over to Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. Hebrews 13 verse 5. There's a lot of different reasons why we lack faith, why we lack belief, but they, there's two that kind of just kind of come to mind. One is will God, when, when we're faced with different things, and God's called us to do something, shown us something in his word. Number one, will God, take, will God take care of me? I'm going through the circumstance, and God wants me to do something. Will God take care of me? In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, we'll look at just a second. But let me tell you this. As a guy who's just got experience, got a little gray on the side, maybe I know it, maybe a thing or two. When I was young, the concept in my parents' home, we weren't poor, we weren't wealthy, but there's always a concept of there was a need for something more. And when I got married and started having, my, started having kids and started having a family, at the early part of it, Shelly could tell you about it, I was very nervous. I didn't understand money. I didn't understand how different things worked. And I was always the guy that was worried about being a failure as a father, being a failure, being able to take care of my family. The crazy thing about God is this. He's always stretching us. He's growing us in our faith. So God put different things in my life, different opportunities. Some opportunities that come to mind is to be a blessing to a missionary, to give to missions or give to different people's needs. Now, when uh, Shelly and I got married, we were very young in the Air Force, and uh, money was tight. I mean, if I sneezed wrong, I think we'd go broke. Money was very tight. <laughs> but I can tell you, as other people in this room can tell you time and time again, that as I stepped out by faith, as what God had told me to do and laid on my heart and my wife's heart, in different aspects. Maybe it was giving money. Maybe it was giving time. Maybe it was giving something else. 
But God just through that and having us grow and give and trust Him and step out by faith has changed my life in such a way that if someone was to ask, ask me the question, will God take care of you? I can say emphatically, beyond any shadow of a doubt, yes, He will. Amen. He will do it. Now, is He going to do it my way? In my time? No. And you know what the best part about that is? It's so much better than anything I could have possibly imagined. My concept when I was younger of, of what a good life was is nothing compared to what God has given me as far as a great life. Amen. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content. Man, there's a lot of times where things were tight and I had to learn to be content. But I tell you what, it was worth every moment. And be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And those are words you can bank on Amen. if you believe them. Amen. If you have faith to trust him. Go over to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. What does that mean? All sufficiency in all things. If you need it, God's going to provide it. If you need it, God's going to provide it. That's what it means. Straightforward, very simple. May abound to every good work. And just like I talked about, there are so many times and so many different circumstances that God has stepped in. And this is an important aspect of our Christian life. Parents is important for us to remember this. Grandparents is important for us to remember this. Teenagers is important for you to understand and start looking for this stuff. When you start looking past, back down the conduit of your life, do you see some important things? And what I'm talking about is this, the fingerprints of God. Where there have been circumstances and opportunities where God is the only reason that that event in the past even came to be. That milestone that you can go, you know what, God did this then in my life. I saw God do this in this person's life. And I'm about to go forward into this. Will God take care of me? It's not blind faith. It's a matter of looking around and listen for the younger to listen to the older who've been there and gone through some things. Say, you know what? God will. But it's going to take me not being the smartest person in the room, because I would be disqualified right off the bat. Not being the, the wealthiest person in the room. We're all disqualified of that. It, it has nothing to do about us. It's all about God. And us simply doing this, believing him. If this word says something, do I believe it? I love how pastor says this often. We only believe the parts of the Bible that we act upon. And it's true. We only believe the parts of the Bible that we actually put into play. So think of it this way. If God, in the parts of the Bible that you've already put into practice, is blessing and working through those things, what about the things you're missing out on in other parts of the Bible? So will God take care of me? And then lastly, is what, God has, is what God has for us better? I don't know. It depends on how you look at things. The thing that we struggle with the most is expectations. It really is expectations. We struggle with that. At, my, at a certain point in life, I want to have X. At a certain, another point in life, I want to have X. And I think things should go a particular way. If I'm building a house, so I want a certain timeline, and I want everything to, to go just this particular way because I have expectations. When we're going through different circumstances, sometimes we get our minds in the way, just like ch uh, children of Israel did at AI, where we're thinking, you know what, I'm about to go through this. And here's what I expect, God. I expect at this point for God to do this. And at this point, for God to do that. And at this point, I expect God to do this. Was, whose plan was that? Was that my plan or God's plan? It was God's. I mean, it was my plan. That's how I saw things. So if I'm setting up expectations of, God, you need to do this. God, you have to do that. You've got to do this. I'm binding God's hands. God's way is far beyond my understanding. And it wasn't me necessarily that, that set up the circumstance, but God's doing what? God's putting something in my life. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's work. I don't know what the situation may be. But God's putting some things in your life, what? To grow us. To test our faith. To grow our faith. I can say that I have a lot of faith, but until I've gone through some things, I really don't know what I believe. I don't know what I'm going to actually do in that circumstance until I actually go through it. But one thing I know gets in my way, if I say, God, you have to do something in a particular time, I hold God up, and it makes a mess of everything. What's my job as a Christian to do? In my class this morning, what's our job? Trust. Trust him to step back out of the way and let God be God. It's as simple as that. I don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. But the great thing is we serve a God who does have all the answers. And he does amazing things. We read about Old Testament Jericho. 
We read, we read about Old, Old Testament AI. There's a Jericho and an AI in your life right now. There's a Jericho and an AI in your neighbor's life right now. And they need somebody to step up and speak the truth. We talked about this in, in Sunday school class this morning. What's going on in Dallas is heartbreaking. It's incredible what's taking place there. And a lot of people go, well, it's this, and it's that, and it's all this stuff. And this is what I can guarantee you. No politician is going to fix it. No smart aleck is going to fix it. What it's going to take is this. You, letting Christ in you be Christ and sharing some truth. Well, Brother Ed, that's in Dallas, and that's here. But there's people all around us that need to hear the truth of Christ. Amen. Need to hear something more than hatred. You need to hear something more than it's this group against that group. And if you look at America right now, we're divided. We have a lot of struggles with that. And why is that? Because the people that have the truth aren't necessarily standing up and speaking the truth with a heart of compassion and sharing that love of Christ and sharing the something more than what society has pulled out for itself. Let's all stand. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Just a few moments, <coughs> we'll have an invitation. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, between you and the Lord this morning, where are you at with your belief? Where are you at with your faith? Is it a Sunday morning thing, and the rest of the week it's not really there? Or is it something that every morning when you wake up, you realize, God, here am I, work through me and do something through me. I don't know what you're going to do in this day, but do something amazing through me. If it's not the latter part, then there's a great opportunity for growth in your life for faith. And there's people in the front row over here that need to see adults with faith that actually moves and walks and talks and shows them something different than what the whole world around them is seeing. Where are you at this morning in this thing? Do you trust God? Are you living a life in Jericho? Victory in Jericho? Or are you living a life that's an AI? Maybe you're here this morning and you're like, I have no idea even what you're talking about. I'm not even at the first part. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross so we can have eternal life. And the only thing we need to have to receive eternal life is to believe Him. If you're that way this morning, I pray the Lord would touch your heart in a special way. And you come forward and, and, and we have somebody who can share the gospel with you and show you the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you so much.